Now you're you're transitioning, I think, into a new role now, right? Yeah. So I guess I kind of skipped into, you know, from food and beverage to hotel. What did the hotel work mean? I was able to help a group out of Raleigh, you know, open a hotel in Vegas, which was also a renovation. Hi, this is Ted Kelly with another Ted's Hospitality Minute. Hey, today we've got an awesome guest on. His name is Matt Wright. He is the Regional Director of Hotel Operations and Revenue for Namada Group. And he's going to come on and talk a little bit about the unique stuff about Namada and also give us a little bit of background on kind of how they came to be, a little bit more on, on how they're set up. And we're looking forward to the conversation with Matt. How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing well this morning. Thanks, Ted, for you know, giving me a little chance to talk this morning. And uh, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're excited to open a new hotel at Namada Hotel Group today when we're recording, at least. Uh, not sure when this comes out, but um, yeah, in, uh, in May of 2024, Namada Hotel Group will have its fifth boutique property on this California Central Coast. And uh, it's, it's just exciting to be a part of. Wow, that, that is awesome. Hey, hey, before we dive into Namada and all the great things that's going on there, tell our viewers a little bit about you and your background. Where, you, where are you from? You grew up in California or always been a, a Cali guy? Or Tell us a little bit more about you. You know, one would think on this California Central Coast as it's it's just this spot where it's, it's destination, but it's not um, it's not L.A. It's not SF. It it's, it's a place where I meet a lot of locals. I am not one. I grew up in North Carolina. I, uh, Winston-Salem and, you know, went to, to college in the Blue Ridge Mountains and, and kind of found a fascination with a destination hospitality there when I worked in, you know, worked throughout college. Um, I was in food and beverage and, uh, and made a transition to hotel at some point. Um, and that's that's a little bit about what I wanted to talk about today because I think it's it's somewhat common. I think it was more common after COVID too. Um, I, I did it prior to that, but um, you know, I, I I've been able to uh, to live and 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 stay in a lot of different places, and and you know, it's it's just it, it's great to be a part of a hospitality um, network that you know people. I think when you, um, and sorry, we'll probably <laughs> skip forward here, but you know, when you think of hospitality as a kid, you, I, I didn't really even know what the word meant probably. And, and looking back, I think someone who go, gets to live in a place where people travel and visit, um, and, and gets to give someone a home for the night or gets to give someone an experience that they've been, you know, saving up for or an experience that they can have with their significant others. It's, it's really special. Um, I think we're in it for a lot of different reasons, but I think that reason really connects almost all of us. Wow. That is awesome. So you're a North Carolina guy. You know, I'm I'm sitting over here in South Carolina, uh, probably less than three hours from where you're talking about. So I know the I know the landscape pretty well. So you got all the way out to Cali. You started working with Namada, right? Now, how long have you been with them? So coming up on four years. Um, I've worked for several hotel groups. Um, before that I was in private clubs in the Carolinas, uh, which were also pretty full rounded hospitality. Um, in the Carolinas there, you know, they do a really good job with having a strong, um, you know, food and beverage, um, experience accommodations, you know, oftentimes and in you know, recreation too. Um, once I kind of realized that I wanted to experience more outside of the community, um, I kind of joined a hotel group doing their food and beverage. So I could not only serve the community, but, but those traveling abroad. And that, that really uh, enticed me from a young age. And, and it, you know, once I had the uh, opportunity to do so from private clubs with a background of, you know, uh, higher end restaurants, it was a nice transition. Um, I think 
when I was at the hotel level in, in the Raleigh Durham area, um, you know, around 2015 to 2017, there was a, a resurgence of certain areas around there, Cary, um, Holly Springs, and, and these areas basically made Raleigh, um, you know, whole. And, and so these sub communities and these properties that maybe had gone to decades of, of misuse or, or, you know, economic changes, uh, suddenly became the forefront of, of a lot of regional hotel groups. Um, and so I've been a part of three that have been focused on kind of under 100 rooms, many would call boutique, um, but really, you know, historical renovations to, uh, centerpieces of small communities, uh, that, that had a full rounded hospitality. And that really kind of changed my perspective going from private clubs over to restaurants and, and hotels, uh, and, and what I see hospitality as now. Yeah. So talk a little bit about Nomada. What would you say is uh, the most unique part of uh, the Nomada Hotel Group and some of the, the hotels that you guys have? Is there a, a distinct, it look, you know, modern, boutique-y, obviously um, nice kind of off the beaten path, but talk about it. What, what do you think the most unique part of Nomada is? So Nomada Hotel Group is um, on the California Central Coast. Uh, all the properties are, are near the 101, you know, that famous north-south travel, um, you know, pathway for people. Um, and, you know, it started in San Luis Obispo, or, or slow, as, as we call it in this, in this area here. And, and you know, slow is, is, is home to Cal Poly University. It's, it's kind of, um, you know, the the centerpiece of, of the central coast that's not Santa Barbara. Um, and you have two smaller wine regions, uh, one's north, one's south of it, Paso Robles and the San Inez Valley. Um, so when the hotel group owners, which, um, you know, they got together mm, 12 to 14 years ago, they took uh, one of the most uh, historic properties in downtown Slow, uh, the Granada Hotel and Bistro, as it is known now, um, opened as Granada in 1922. So you have this brick building, uh, you know, Hollywood era, um, you know, building that really went to low income housing and was set to be demolished. And if you see it today, you would just, you know, be, you would wonder why that would happen. Um, because of what design and creativity can do to, to buildings and, and locations. And going back to locations, you know, the, uh, the 101 is pretty prevalent in the rest of our properties in the sense that they are remotels. So, you know, the, the motels bones back in the day, uh, kind of most of them beginning in the fifties and sixties are part of the other four properties and their locations are so great because they're, they're all off the freeway. They're all off the highway. Um, and the setup might be odd when you first get it, but our group has focused on design and changing the layout of these to really become boutique resorts. And that's where our model I think is different is, you know, some people kind of dress up a motel and call it a remotel, but we actually, uh, aside from Granada, that first property, we actually take a motel's bones and uh, turn it into what we call a boutique resort. So you have fine amenities. They're in the uh, personal setting of less than 50 rooms, and they're in a great, great accessible location. So, Yeah, that sounds really cool. So you're really... You're really taking the folks that don't want to be on the freeway, want the scenic route, and you're giving them some nice little spots along the way that they can actually stop, you know, spend a night, two nights, whatever, enjoy a great setting, and then kind of get in the way and, and journey off. Yeah, yeah. There's often times where I'm at one of the properties and, you know, what maybe it's on the North County one and, and we're chatting and, and, you, you see where they're headed to next because you do have a lot of travelers north and southbound for 
for all the reasons in the world and, and some of the reasons are, are coming from another place in the world and they are um, they're exploring. They're not only traveling, but they're exploring and so they're headed southbound and they're headed to one of our other hotels and, and it's it's not because they were aware of the brand yet, which some are, um, but they just wanted a style um, and an easy to you know travel location where you don't really drop any standards and it's uh you can keep going on your way and it's it's pretty cool yeah i i uh it it sounds like it's actually a uh and my wife always beats me up because i like to take the scenic route and she likes to just she likes to go a to b and uh you know, it's like it sounds like it's the perfect path for someone like myself that would actually like to view some of the back roads and see how people actually live as opposed to being on the interstate and trying to fly up and down the road. So it, it sounds like it's really a, a nice little adventure for folks to have the time to explore it and enjoy it. Yeah, you're so spot on. And I think that we could take care of you as a couple because we are near the freeway. But Ted a lot of these properties are gateways to, you know, wine country and the beach and you don't have to go very far, but you, if you decide to take the time like you, you can. And, uh, and that's, what's cool. Like for instance, Los Alamos, um, there's two of them. One probably everyone thinks of with Oppenheimer, right? Los Alamos, New Mexico. That's where the, the bombs were tested in the, in the, um, in the forties. Nope. Los Alamos, California, um, Skyview Hotel, uh, has been kind of top 10. It's been top 10, uh, motel in America by USA Today. That's one of ours. And it's in a community of 2,500, 3,000. Um, but there is probably 15 to 20 wineries and, and such around that area that you can visit. There's a Michelin star a uh, restaurant and a Michelin recognized restaurant on a strip that's not longer than, you know, two blocks. Uh, and so you don't always have to be revitalizing uh, warehouses in a city for, you know, breweries and hotels and such. There are communities that you can drive um, that are super small with boutique hotels if they're on a pathway that people are either traveling or want to travel um, you know, and we, we do make partners with the other areas of hospitality that we don't offer. You know, we have a restaurant, but we don't want to be a Michelin star restaurant. We want to be pretty approachable, but those that do, we have a great partner in Bell's restaurant down in Los Alamos too. So I think community relationships and location is really a big part of what we, what we, you know, push. So... Hey, that's awesome. Hey, let's let's pause right there. I gotta I gotta give a shout out to my sponsors, or they won't sponsor us anymore, right? So I won't be able to have you guys on. So give me one second. Hey, THM viewers, this episode is being sponsored by Recovery. If you've experienced a home fire, tornado, or other natural disaster, you know how easy it is to lose everything overnight. Well, Recover is a new app. It allows you to record everything in your home, store it in the clouds for easy retrieval should disaster strike versus you trying to remember and recall all of your household valuables, jewelry, heirlooms, etc. It allows you to settle your claim with your insurance companies a lot faster. Check out the Recover It app today. And if you sign up today, there's a 50% off promo code that's on the screen right now. Click on it and you will get 50% off your yearly subscription. And as always, we like to remind our viewers, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us here and follow us on LinkedIn. This episode with Matt will be on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. And we always, always, always appreciate your thoughts and feedback on every episode. So Matt, let's pick up where we were leaving there. You have played in a couple different roles for Namada, right? I think you started out in food and beverage. I think you're transitioning now into another role. Talk a little bit about that. So going from food and beverage to what you're doing now, what, what's that like? Yeah, well, I know I'm not the only one. And I know that there's many pathways for people in hospitality to, to kind of do what they want. And you know, from early part in my career, 
I knew that I enjoyed what I was doing. I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do long term. Maybe that's all of us. Um, but I, I can say that that my my strategy, um, whether I knew it or not at the time, was putting myself around people that did a lot of different, you know, or had a lot of different disciplines and experiences in hospitality. So when I was working in the private club industry, you know, I was kind of a, a young assistant food and beverage manager, but I was, you know, eyes on, ears on to the events team, um, the accommodations, w which were although limited, they weren't exactly a hotel, but they were more of like an inn situation. Um, you know, there was the golf pros with the, you know, the golf course and the tennis and, and things like that. That's kind of your classic Carolina club and, and things along those lines. Um, and so I kind of was during that time realizing what I enjoyed and what I didn't, uh, whether I realized it or not. And by putting myself in those those spaces and, and those collaborative teams, um, you know, working with chefs and uh, managing bartenders, uh, I, I found that it, it is, for one, really exciting to be a part of a team that creates an experience from all of those disciplines in fantastic locations. So once I, you know, had an opportunity in the Raleigh-Durham era area to uh, move to hotels, I really found that you can really do everything in, in those locations if you choose hotels that are in a destination area that offer food and beverage and, and a restaurant that's kind of the heart of the hotel um, where people would not only choose to stay in a place for the room but stay in a place to uh, to enjoy the restaurant to walk around town um, that honestly that really uh, that really touched me because I didn't travel too much as a child. So, you know, and, I, and I'm not sure how everyone else gets to travel before they're 18, but I didn't really get to get on a plane until I graduated high school. And, you know, we would do a little bit of road trips once a year uh, with my family. But once I kind of got a taste of that, it just kept evolving. And I was like, all right, well, you know, growing up on the East Coast, I was like, well, let's keep going north. Let's keep going west. And, and when you do that, you find a whole uh, just, you know, different set of reasons why you want to do the next thing. And, and so it was definitely evolving. I didn't know I wanted to be in hotels. I didn't know I wanted to control revenue and operations when I was 18 or whatever the case may be. I don't even think I knew half of what that meant. Um, but I think as long as you're putting yourself in operations and, and, and companies that offer, you know, different pathways, I think you can find fulfillment because you're you're down a pathway and and you can choose to continue that or you can hopefully if you're at the right place uh get a bit of uh experience or some teachings from others around you if they're willing. So uh, that that's kind of how I started my transition and, and how I've kind of looked back and, and realized how it happened. Now you're you're transitioning I think into a new role now, right? So, yeah, so, so I guess I kind of skipped into, you know, from food and beverage to hotel, what did the hotel work mean? I, I was able to help a, a group out of Raleigh, you know, open a hotel in Vegas, which was also a renovation, a uh, heavy food and beverage. So I was kind of right at home in that way. I, I didn't, I, I was able to learn the hotel at my own pace. Um, and the opportunity there um, allowed me to kind of balance my skill set of food and beverage and hotel where I was able to join Pacifica Hotel Group, which is the largest boutique group on the West Coast. Um, and that was prior to COVID. Um, and then once COVID occurred, uh, I realized that I needed to expand my skill set beyond operations. So when COVID happened, um, I was laid off for the first time in my career and, and, you know, that feeling was odd, you know, it's like, okay, they, they don't want me to continue going to work, which is a very simple concept. And obviously in a very complicated situation and world and a decision that had to be made as they kind of closed the property for a long period of time. But, um, 
it did invigorate me to expand my knowledge, which it, it, you know ended up being um, going into some revenue management learning opportunities, um, talking to colleagues about other avenues, and um, you know that time period was important for me to find other administrative skill sets that I didn't really even know I had. I loved Excel. I didn't really know what to do with Excel, but I knew I loved it. And once, you know, operations uh, ceased at that property, you know, a few months later after some, some knowledge that I had gained and some cert certifications I did too, uh, I gained, you know, a GM role with Nomada Hotel Group um, operating Skyview Los Alamos um, in 2020. Um, and the transition that I later had from just hotel operations really was, uh, one of two things. It was building just further operations experience in different companies that give you more opportunities to learn the administrative side, the revenue side, some do, some don't. Um, so one, it was just you know, taking new opportunities, but two, it was a self drive to learn and get more certifications for what could be next. Um, so that, that, that next point that, that, uh, you know, next transition that I had was, um, you know, managing revenue for a, a hotel group that didn't exactly have a revenue manager yet. The, the growth was to get there. Um, and currently we're, we're close. Uh, but my, my role is to still oversee operations and revenue for, for, um, for, uh, the five properties. So I haven't had my identity crisis just quite yet where I can still have operations and still have revenue in my job description and, and know the teams kind of give them some insights on the four markets that we compete in at the same time. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, when you're looking to transition, I, I transitioned COVID kind of invigorated me, but I was also a part of a hotel group that, um, there was a revenue manager. There were multiple levels of administrative roles that I hadn't seen because I had been a part of smaller groups. And, and again, I had myself around different pathways and, and, um, I just, I've never wanted to isolate myself into one, uh, path or, you know, in a place where I didn't have a team around me. Um, just constantly in a place to learn. And when I stopped learning, I would, I would, uh, I would move on somewhere. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. So a typical a typical day in a life for you is like what? Yeah, well I do I, I wake up and do a podcast right away. No, I, I <laughs> this is uh not something I do too often and again I'm I'm thankful for the opportunity. But no, my day really starts with um as many others do with checking for the most important emails. You know, is there an owner? Is there an owner on my Gmail right now? Um, it, it, are there one of the management partners? Uh, and then it's, and then it's going straight into the revenue, um, for the day, the week, um, and checking, you know, high pacing dates. Um, now once that's complete and, and I, I feel like I've identified anything really strong in either direction, um, you know, I, I note that for, depending on the day, a revenue call with the property leader, which, which is our general manager at each property. And then I have other meetings that are a part of operations. Now what's cool about my job and, and not everyone gets to do this. And maybe some people wouldn't want to do this, but I, there's pretty much five work days. Sometimes there's six in our industry, but we have five hotels now. And so I am pretty much in a place in slow where I'm traveling 30 minutes to an hour to have my work day out of my bag into each property. And so I'm able to work at each property every, every week. Um, we have five responsibility points for these team leaders that we've identified as most important, uh, for their property success. And for one, it's, it's revenue. So, so we want the GMs to have a pulse on revenue. Um, and it is, it does vary per team member. You know, we give them an opportunity to show us how much they want to learn it and we'll fill in the gaps uh, because the GM that we want to support at each property, as we all know, has to have a pretty wide skill set. So if we have them focusing on revenue at a 30 or 40 room property and it's too much and their team members aren't getting the support they need, it's, it's a trickle down that we can't control, but we can control revenue. So 
So revenue is our big, um, you know, variable where we, we fill in the gaps that we need to, and that's kind of what my role is. And so when the GM has an understanding of revenue, they have an understanding of what their labor and costs need to be. So if we're pacing down or up, you know, they, they, they we flow into the conversation and the, the talking points of, of what are you doing about revenue or about costs. And, and then usually when you get through revenue and you get through cost point two, our point three is our team. So the team is kind of the center point to those five points because you're taking, uh, you know, the, the labor and seeing how many hours they're getting, which, uh, you know, people schedule and, and when they're at work and at their best is, is going to give you hospitality people. Um, and, and obviously there's, uh, you know, HR and other points in the, in the team, uh, section, but, but that kind of flows into, uh, guest satisfaction as everyone's team gives you, uh, which, you know, we have surveys, we have reviews, uh, that we, we pull from, but a, a lot of it is, is the team talking to us about what they feel like is going on and what advancements they feel like they should be making. Um, and then point five, which we'll circle back to our hotel group is design and aesthetic and maintenance. So that is huge. We're renovating properties from the twenties. We're renovating properties from the fifties and our ownership and our management groups standard is for them to always look new, uh, with, <laughs> with a brick building a hundred years old and a motel on a hilltop that gets wind and rain and it's gotten a fire before, uh, you know, years ago, but that maintenance and aesthetic. So, so we encourage all the managers to do that walk around their property to start their day. Cause that's a little different than my day. Uh, and to, to finish their day the same way after they, you know, speak with their team and hit their objectives. But yeah, we have a pretty robust responsibility set for our managers because as you probably know, with talking to all the fantastic people you do, the scaling of, of, of hospitality is enormous. I lived in Vegas, so I know the 10,000 room hotels and I know the 10 room hotels, and the smaller you get, the GM's job becomes you know, fixing toilets becomes fixing, um, you know, celebrity problems. Like those are two things that they'll do in the same day. Uh, and, and having the right person for that is just, it's so important. Yeah, no, that is, uh, that is so spot on. And since we play on the capital side, we're always engaging our clients with capital plans and what renovations are needed and, you know, what about this? What about that? What about the risk of this? And so when you're talking about specifically old buildings, and you're talking about California, which California has got its whole set up on how they like to view codes and, you know, <laughs> oh my goodness. So you are, uh, you are spot on. So it is a, it is quite unique to be dealing with older buildings and trying to make new with current, uh, guidelines for what they're asking for in construction. So that's an interesting, that's a definitely interesting setup and conversation. I could, I could hear that one going off right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The guidelines and the guest expectations. Um, yeah. they, you know, they want a boutique experience and they want the room to be, you know, completely modernized most times. Um, in an, in an environment that, you know, you didn't, you didn't tear down the property. So there's, there's certain, um, preventative maintenance is, is just so key to these properties. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So Matt, tell us what's coming up at, uh, on the, on the agenda, on the calendar for Nomada. I mean, you got some big events coming up here in the next few weeks or months that all of our viewers should, should scurry out to, uh, the California to, to make sure they see and visit. Yeah. Um, you know, in addition to a few of our properties that have been around for a few years, uh, we just opened farmhouse Paso last year, uh, in Paso Robles, a 1946 kind of cottage style property right in downtown Paso Robles. So, uh, very walkable to the upcoming mid state fair in July. Uh, the mid state fair is, one of the biggest fairs on the West coast, you know, we've got 
uh, Miranda Lambert coming into town, um, Jelly Roll, uh, you know, and it doesn't stop there. There's Nickelback, you know, so you have all kinds of fun uh, attractions from all the genres and all the eras. Um, and so, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's a reason for people to get together. There's a lot of concerts in the area, but um, Farmhouse Pasta wasn't the only hotel. Uh, we're actually opening right now in May, uh, River Lodge Paso, uh, which we think is, is, you know, going to be one of the finest boutique resorts for, uh, for a, a good range because we have, um, you know, multiple room types that cater to all types of individuals. We have a bar suite. We have obviously, you know, regular suites, our classics, our classics, our base room has a hammock and a fireplace and good square footage. Um, you know, us usually the motel blueprint that we, we get and we're given, um, you know, is pretty small. Families traveling 50 years ago, they just want to, you know, park in front and, and just get in the room. But this is actually a pretty impressive property. Um, massive pool, uh, spa, biking around Paso Robles. Uh, that's a pretty exciting thing coming up. Um, and beyond that, just the central coast of California, which is, uh, is getting into wine season. You know, we're getting into those seventies and eighties temperature days, um, where, uh, you know, you can really enjoy the beach and the wine in the same day. And, and, um, and that's a pretty exciting time for us. So, yeah, that is so awesome. <laughs> Man, I definitely appreciate you giving me a few minutes of your time today. I know you're a busy guy, and I know you uh, you start each and every day with a podcast. Just make sure it's Ted's <laughs> Hospitality Minute, okay, when you start today. All so right? far, it's, it's, it's mostly you, Ted. It's, it's mostly you. <laughs> we thank you again, man, for the time. Good luck with the opening. Oh, man, I'm looking forward to hearing – Great things about the property. And if I ever get out there near the one-on-one, I'll be looking you guys up. Thank you. Thank you for the time. This has been another Ted's Hospitality Minute. Hey, we like to remind our viewers, please follow us on LinkedIn. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. This episode with Matt will be on Apple Podcasts and Spotify shortly. And as always, we always appreciate your thoughts and feedback on how we can get better. Again, this is another Ted's Hospitality Minute. We'll see you guys next time. Have a great day. Ted's Hospitality Minute is sponsored by Recover It. Don't wait for disaster to happen to wish you had done this.